Well, good morning. This is Rick Patterson, and I have a special guest with us today, Ricky Yabor, who is an attorney at law here in the state of Florida, active in the city of Miami. On the page there, you see his website, his phone number, and you can contact him. So I'm glad you're here today. Thanks, Rick. Thanks for having me here. It's always, uh, well, I've known you for a long time, so I uh, always enjoy your teachings and and watching you set up this morning, I realize and I appreciate now how difficult it is to uh, <laughs> set this up. <laughs> I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing either. But I'll tell you what. It's, I had planned um, to go ahead and teach and continue the teaching if it's, if it's to be. It's up to me part two from last week. And then, lo and behold, everything in America, the landscape, shifted. It just changed overnight with the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Well, now this becomes, in my opinion, the most critical and most important topic in the election for November. Uh, because Trump now, President Trump, has the ability to nominate an individual and probably get that person confirmed, uh, you know, before he, even if he loses. Uh, which I don't think he will, but even if he does, he can get someone confirmed before he leaves office in, in January. So um, this becomes the topic of the election. Forget coronavirus, forget uh, it, any topic. Um, this is immigration, it. Immigration, anything. This is it. The right. wall, the economy, Russia, China, it, it doesn't matter anymore. No, right now is who is going to be the nominee and... And, and why the Democrats are going to oppose that, whoever it is, they're going to be opposed no matter what. Um, so Trump has the ability now to uh, put a person in there that the Democrats are going to have to oppose. And if, and if he selects the correct person, which I believe he will, um, it becomes, a, 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 I think, a dagger in, in the Democrats' heart uh, in, as far as the election is concerned. So uh, we'll see who he puts in there. We have some ideas, but... Yeah, we'll talk about that in a moment. Good morning, Melissa. Nice to see you. Uh, Glenda uh, says, good morning, Rick and Rick. Elda, good morning, church. Glenda, good morning. I'm assuming everyone can hear us. If you can hear us, just go ahead and make sure. And I only ask that question. Uh, it's not because uh, I'm, I, I need to ask it, but I do need to ask it because I'm not sure if all the equipment works all the time, every time. So if you can hear us, that's fine. I know there's a little delay. But we're going to... Um, talk a little bit back and forth today about what's going to happen in the next few days, in the next few weeks in America. And to give us a little background um, concerning all of these issues, um, as you know, I've been involved in the pro-life movement, I mean, for many, many years, and I want to just get a little historical perspective of that. In fact, uh, you were one of the attorneys that represented our first uh, demonstration and set-in, uh, right over here in Kendall Drive in US-1, you and Dean DeBartolomeo uh, bailed us out of uh, uh, the, 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 the rest and all of the things that happened then, and uh, which was really effective. That abortion clinic was eventually closed down. I was actually with the state attorney's office at that point. <laughs> oh, so you were on the, bad, on, the yes. on the other side, huh? Yeah, well, where I, wherever I'm at, I'm the good guy. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that was, you know, that I, I don't remember the year, but that was back when uh, Operation Rescue. That was like 92 or something. Yeah, and I just dropped my mouse here. Oh, boy. We'll get it. Okay. Don't worry about it. This is... Don't try this on your own, okay? <laughs> it's an impossible <laughs> feat. All right, so uh, let me give you a little perspective of why and this is personal to me. Uh, and, and I say this not to make this about me, but to make it about why this became so emphatically a spiritual revelation and epiphany in my life. I didn't grow up believing in abortion was wrong. In fact, um, I had a degree in biology, and and I bought into the whole uh, fetus is not a, a human being concept for many, many years. And uh, as I went to Indiana University and bought into this thing, okay, and I could, I could, I could uh, validate why we shouldn't 
have late term abortions, but I thought in the first trimester it really didn't matter, whatever. And I began to get uh, uh, active in abortion when I began to look at the scripture that says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and I had a plan and purpose for your life. And I saw the, the sanctity of life. And then as I began to get involved in the Right to Life movement, I was on uh, all kinds of programs, as you remember, on the radio constantly, on CNN. I, I, I mean, I was... You know, I was a pretty hot issue at that time back in the 1980s and the early 90s and on this particular issue. And um, I remember I was debating that went on the Morton Downey show. Remember him? The guy with the teeth, right? The guy with the teeth. Yep. They called him the loud mouth. Yeah. <laughs> what most people don't know is Morton Downey was the first president of National Right to Life. Yes. First president. And uh, that surprised me. So, um, but anyway, let me get back to my story. So. As I was involved and we had people coming and, and I saw the movie, The Silent Scream, by Dr. Jane, uh, Nathan Burns, uh, Burnson, I think it is. Uh, and you can go on uh, Google, YouTube, The Silent Scream. And I saw what was taking place actually in abortion and, and it just really transformed the way I saw things. And then after I got involved, my mother came to me and uh, she said, and she was tearful, she was crying to and she says, I want to just talk to you for a moment. And I said, okay. She says, when I became pregnant, your father and I, we were not married. And he pushed me to have an abortion. Now, this is back in 1952. And realize abortion was illegal in the state of Indiana. But my family had connections with doctors and medical facilities. And and um, my grandmother arranged that she could go and and into a doctor's office and he had performed the abortion so i got mom tell was telling me the story and i had no idea whatsoever what was going on and all of a sudden she told me she says i was on the table the procedure had begun i had my legs up in the stirrup i was ready to go ahead and, and proceed with the abortion and she said all of a sudden something inside of me said you cannot kill this baby and she got up off the abortion table and i'm here now the important part of that is not that i'm here per se but i'm glad i am i mean <laughs> okay i'll be here by myself <laughs> <laughs> exactly i mean that, you know but here's what was amazing to me my father who had pushed for an abortion uh right at the beginning the very last words, and I'm going to turn off my phone. Is your phone off, by the way? Yes. Um, the very last words my father said to me before I, he passed away. I went to visit him during Christmas time, and he had repeatedly told my brother and I, I wish your mother had aborted Rick. Now, obviously, he had a hatred and animosity on some level that I wasn't aborted. Mm -hmm. And the last words he said to me as I went to visit him in a nursing home in, in Indiana, Muncie, Indiana, I walked in the room, I had some gifts, and we got off on this thing and he started, he says, you know, I wish your mother had aborted you. I looked at him and I had heard this before, my brother had heard it before. I looked at him and I said, Dad, this will be the last time I will speak with you, the last time I see you. Have a Merry Christmas. And I walked out of the room, and a couple of months later, my dad passed. The reason I'm sharing this story with you is because this became something that's not just theoretical. This is a personal thing, okay? I mean, I was literally about to be aborted. I believe God intervened, spoke to my mother, and I'm here. Now, the truth is, since 1973... There have been millions and millions and millions of children die from abortion. Last week, and I don't know if you noticed, I played that little commercial that I started running on Facebook. I did this before Ginsburg had passed away. Right. I felt impressed that I should begin to, we should begin as Christians to vote pro-life. I'm not telling you which party to vote for, but there's only one party that's that's pro-life and the other one's pro-abortion. Mm -hmm. uh, 
<laughs> and um, so this morning, as I as I began to get ready for today, I said, we cannot miss this opportunity to talk about abortion in America. And that's why I had you decide to come on. Uh, as a lawyer, knowing uh, some of the ins and outs and some of the people that's involved in who President Trump is going to nominate. This is going to be battle royale. This is going to be... And remember, when the beginning of this pandemic, I told you this was a clash between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. This is the classic example of the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness fighting. That's going to be front and center in the next couple of months. I, I wanted to just share a couple uh, things of information for you. Uh, and you can go to National Right to Life. That's N R L uh, Right to National Right to Life. <laughs> I think it's N R L C dot org. Yeah, that's it. And uh, you can get these statistics. But I, I decided to print them out this morning, and just to give us some information and some background on what's going on. And we have this whole argument that's going on right now: Black Lives Matter and so forth. And people started arguing that Kanye was just out of his mind because as he became a Christian, he realized that millions and millions of black lives are being killed in America through abortion by design. That's what Planned Parenthood was about. It couldn't be more clear. There have been over 61 million children aborted in the United States since 1973. Over 61 million. You know, we have these argument. People go, we don't have enough people in America. We need to import people. We need to allow immigration to open up the borders because we don't have enough people. The reason we don't have enough people is because we killed 61 million people. It's mm -hmm. as simple as that. All right. Now, out of that 61 million, 27%, 27% we're African-American. So that gives me almost 30 million, okay, well, 20 million, somewhere around there, children, African-American children died. This is absolutely a phenomenal number. And uh, to give everybody a little bit of history, this started back in 1973. Let me pull up my, my site here. Okay. Let's see who else jumped online with this. Okay, good morning, Nancy. That must be a friend of yours. Nancy, that's my sister-in-law. I see that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Nancy. <laughs> but let's just get a little bit about the history, and then we'll talk about the potential candidates. Okay. Okay. 1973, Roe v. Wade, landmark decision, which, in my opinion, unconstitutional. They basically, the liberals created law where there was none. What, what, is, what is your take on that? Well, the funny thing about that case, because I specifically remember arguing this case in, uh, in law school during a constitutional law class, and the professor set it up beautifully, and I think he did it on purpose, although he wouldn't say it. But if you read the Dred Scott decision, and then you read the Roe v. Wade decision back to back, the, the, the arguments from the liberals are exactly the same. You know, that it's not a human. Uh, therefore, they're, they're not protected under the Constitution. That's exactly what uh, the Dred Scott decision read. So the argument in class was, uh, you know, if, if you believe in abortion and you believe that the Dred Scott decision is correct, I mean, uh, the Roe v. Wade decision is correct, then you would have supported slavery back in during the Dred Scott because that's the exact same reasoning, uh, you know, behind that. Um, that's why it's important to have not only Supreme Court justices, which is why I am very involved in local elections with, with uh, local judges. It's not only important to have uh, you know, correct Supreme Court justices, it's also important to have you know, good judges at the lower levels because those are the judges that are going to be coming up. And those are the judges whom the presidents in the future are going to be selecting you know, future Supreme Court justices. Uh, that's why I've always been involved. I ran for judge in 2012, and since then I've been heavily involved 
uh, with uh, judicial elections in, in South Florida, which also helps me out in practice because there's a whole saying, you know, a good lawyer knows the law, but a great lawyer knows the judges. Exactly. So, you know, it's a good way to know the judges as well. Um, so, you know, it's important to not only, you know, look at this nominee uh, and who Trump is going to nominate, but also important when elections come up to make sure you, you're voting for, for the correct judge. Exactly. Uh, Roe v. Wade, they used the 14th Amendment, okay, to, and, and this is where I have problems, and, and I've talked about this in our church services over the years, and unfortunately, we have generation now that have no background in constitutional or the civics or how the government works in America through the public school. They don't teach it anymore. It's just, it's not there. Right. And the idea that, for example, that the Constitution is this archaic document that's, you know, written by racist white men 200 and some years ago is nonsense. It's the probably the greatest constitutional work in the history of nations, clearly given the most freedoms. And one of the things that happened there in, in, in the 14th Amendment is rather than the legislature, which is the way it's supposed to work. The legislator's supposed to write a law. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to vote on it. It's supposed to go to the Senate. It's supposed to go to committee. They go back and forth. They revise it and bring it together. Then they submit it to the President of the United States to either uh, ratify or, or, veto or, it. Or, or, or appeal it, correct? Veto. Okay, a, a veto it, yeah. Okay, so now the problem is, over the years, what has happened is liberals and People who were anti-Christian, anti-God, well, uh, let's go ahead and say it, socialist, uh, in nature, used the courts and argued theory uh, and take court cases to try to create law, and the Supreme Court was never designed to create law, yet it has done so multiple times. Dred Scott is a perfect example of that, as well as Roe v. Wade. You know, it's funny because... It's, it's a hypocritical argument on the part of the liberals because they say, well, our, our, our country was founded by racist and a bunch of white men, and they created this constitution. But then at the same time, they say, well, the constitution is a living constitution. So it's, it's either one or the other. You either, it's an old document that's, you know, by racist white men, or it's a living constitution where they can make changes to it all the time. So then what's the problem if they believe it's a living constitution? Exactly. And I and I want to talk about the, the, the myth that if Roe v. Wade was overturned, and that's really where the argument is going to be on who is appointed and uh, nominated, and I hope that the Senate will go ahead and approve before the end of this year. The whole argument is that abortion will be illegal. There will be no more legal abortions in America. That is a fallacy. I mean, there was abortion prior to Roe v. Wade, for example, the state of New York. State of New York had abortion legal for forever and a day. I think abortion was legal in Florida before Roe v. Wade, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, Roe v. Wade basically took that power from the state to make the, its own determination as to whether abortion should be legal or not and, and federalized it. Uh, that's all Roe v. Wade did, uh, made it a, a national law. So if Roe v. Wade is overturned, all that's going to happen is that the states then have the right to make their own determination as to whether abortion is legal or not. And so what we'll have, we'll have some states, let's say, for example, you went to law school in Mississippi, which is a pretty conservative state concerning abortion. Mississippi would possibly say there'd be no legal abortions except in maybe a rape or a death of the right. incest or the, the uh, life of the mother. Okay. Right. Right. The state of Florida may say abortion will be legal up to the third trimester. I mean, up to the, the, the first trimester. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is in the state of New York, just this year, uh, if you saw uh, Governor Cuomo, which I don't know why people think he's such a, a hero. He's, he's a pro-abortion. I mean, he killed literally thousands of people in nursing homes in this COVID virus. I mean, it's just a, it's a disgrace. But in the state of New York, the assembly passed a law that abortion can take place up to, in fact, the day of birth. Right. 
He signed it, and you can go on YouTube. And he got applauded. And, and, and the entire assembly stood up applauding like he had just won the Super Bowl. Right. How in the world can a governor sign a law that says you can kill a baby up to the day, ninth month? They, the, the baby can be in the, in the passageway coming out. And you can kill that baby, and they stand up and applaud. I, I, I where, where, how does that happen? You're asking the wrong person because I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I mean, think about it. what sickness. It's a sickness. The same thing happened in Virginia. I was about to say that it happened in Virginia as well. I think Virginia went even further. What What did Virginia say? I think I think they can kill the child outside the womb. Exactly. The baby can be born, and the governor. He clearly tells you that they will keep the baby comfortable and until the parents decide whether they want to kill the baby or not. Right. Is there a time limit for that? I, I, mean, I don't five know. Five years? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, is it five minutes, ten minutes, <laughs> uh, age 21? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's at some point we have lost all type of sanity when it comes to this issue. Now, if Roe v. Wade was overturned, Literally, literally, each state would then have the opportunity to make decision based upon what that 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 state's population decides is 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 right. Right, and that's the way the Tenth Amendment in the Constitution is written: that the states have the right, other than the enumerated rights that the Constitution gives the federal government, the states are responsible for everything else. And then what the state doesn't say, the individual's responsible for. Right. Well. You know, once, and I think eventually Roe v. Wade now, in my opinion, I think it will be overturned. Um, and once that happens, there will be states where you can go get an abortion. So if you live in a state, like you mentioned Mississippi, and you want to go get a, an abortion and it's available right next door in Tennessee, you can drive over there and have an abortion. There's nothing precluding you from doing that. Exactly, exactly. Or if the local states around Jason Tate's, then you can go to New York City or New York State. Right. California uh, will give them for free, probably. And 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 on top of that, they'll probably have uh, liberals paying your plane ticket to go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, what about this myth? Thousands will die from illegal back alley abortions. Okay. Well, I've never seen uh, any statistic or any anything that shows that that's true or or that it was even true before 1973. So that's just a a straw man argument where they, they create an issue and then they argue it. So I, I, I pay no attention to that. And you went back to Dred Scott for a moment, and uh, I, I want to just put, pop this up on the screen, and let me see if I can pull this over here. Uh, oh, you had that up. I didn't even... We didn't even talk about Dred Scott before, man. <laughs>
wanted. These were your exact same arguments. Roe v. Wade, 7-2, Dred Scott, 7-2 decision that took place. And it's a amazing thing that we now have the opportunity to re change and redress this absolute atrocity, legal atrocity, where over 61, 60, they say 65 million, it's estimated that 3.3 billion children have been aborted in the world. I was going to say, that's just in, in the United States. Exactly. You know. Exactly. And we have people who argue, in there and they want to talk. Let me just give you a couple of numbers here. Um, I'll go back here, for example. And most people don't realize that the argument for abortion came from the eugenics movement. And that came from Thomas Robert Malthus, who wrote the essay on the principle of population. And the argument was that the population is growing faster than there's food on the, in the world. So therefore, we need to eliminate population. That was then uh, Francis Galt, who is the cousin of Charles Darwin. He's the one that uh, is known for pioneering the studying of human intelligence. Now, what Galt did was quite interesting. Do you remember back in the 80s where there was a book called The Bell Curve? Yes. Okay, where the argument was... Uh, it, and it wasn't really a racist book, okay? It was deemed to be a racist book because statistically uh, the the author showed that uh, whites had more in, in, I, higher IQ than blacks. But it the argu racial argument stopped because the Asians have a higher IQ than the whites. Right. IQ is not a function of the color of your skin. It's a function of your environment and, and your upbringing. And, right. and your ability to work. Exactly. So these arguments were based upon what Francis Galt said when he started studying uh, human intelligence and showing that there were inferior groups of people on the planet hmm. that, that needed to be eliminated. Of course, then Charles Darwin, he continued on with the, the evolution theory and, and, and the evolution of man. This was the basis and the justification why Joseph Stalin could kill 15 million Russians and Ukrainians. Because you had, they, they had lower IQs, they were inferior, they were not superior. That's the same mentality that Mussolini used, and I'm reading over here from my notes, where he massacred 4 million Ethiopians, uh, 2 million uh, Eritians, and 1 million Serbs, Crows, Croats and Albanians. Then Adolf Hitler, he comes in and he starts eliminating Jews, six million, but he also killed two million Slavs, one million Poles, and two million Gypsies. And how do we get there? We get there because we come to a, a society where there, it, God is not a part of their consciousness and man is not, sanct there's no sanctity of human life and we can justify killing people. The murder of all murderers. Hmm. The murder of all murderers. It's not Adolf Hitler. No. It's not Mussolini. It's Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger, who is the founder, the founder of Planned Parenthood. Is everybody still on the line here? Go ahead and somebody say something here. I, I don't know if we're boring you. I'll tell you what. We're just going to go. We'll break for another little, little commercial here, and we will... Get
citizenship. I mean, this is incredible. Well, we now have the the ability uh, through a Supreme Court nominee to to change all this, which is why this has now become and will be the topic for the next few months. All right. You know, uh, uh, coming up to the uh, November third election. Let's talk about the two possible candidates. The Trump announced that he will replace replace Ginsburg with a woman. Right. In my opinion, there are two very well qualified constitutional judges right who are pro life right you want to discuss those for, for us? right and 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 just so you know there's you know we, we we're focusing on pro life because and they are pro life but they're mainly constitutionalists which means uh you know there's basically two you know trains of thought here there's the people who believe that the constitution is a a living document which is usually sides with the the, the liberal side of the uh, of of the politicians which means that you know the constitution can change uh, over time uh, based on you know someone's uh, belief because it's a living constitution and then and I, re- I recall in law school Scalia came and talked to us at at the law school and he says I believe then therefore in the dead constitution because the Constitution is a legal document. It's a contract, and you read a contract based on uh, exactly. interpreting what the, the 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 signers of the contract meant it to be. So, and if you want to change then that contract, you got to amend it, which is why the Constitution allows for constitutional amendments. So, if you don't like what a, the Constitution says, then you amend it. So, anyway, there's two that come to mind uh, uh, possible uh, uh, nominees. One is uh, Amy Barrett who's a Seventh Circuit uh, Court of Appeals judge. She's uh, 48 years old, Catholic. She was uh, appointed uh, to the eleventh to the Seventh Circuit back in, um, in May of 2017. Uh, and she comes to mind, and if you recall back in 2017, um, there was some controversy uh, regarding her nomination because the Democrats were uh, going after her because of her Christian views. So... You know, some people were saying that she is not qualified to be a judge because of her Christian slash Catholic views, especially when it comes to, you know, abortions. And what a lot of people need to understand is that judges, um, and, I, and I know this because I'm involved in judicial elections a lot, they have to follow what's called Canon 7. And Canon 7 requires judges not to make political statements or have a platform that's why when you see judges running for 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 a certain court or for county court they, they don't really have a platform they just have to say i'm going to be fair and neutral and here's my here are my qualifications um so that's why in a lot of the confirmation hearings you, you hear uh judges not wanting to answer and it's because of canon seven they cannot make those type of comments yeah now, now let me let me just interrupt you a moment if you are a constitutional judge, yes, the issue does not, is not, am I pro-life or pro-abortion? It is, is abortion a constitutional right? Right. Based upon the Constitution. Well, I don't see it in the Constitution. So, um, you know, when you read the Constitution... Uh, especially in the first, you know, in the amendments, you see your, your right to, you know, the free speech, the uh, press. Uh, there are enumerated rights, and there's enumerated things that the government can do to you, like the Fourth Amendment, search and seizures, and that sort of thing. Is it a, an enumerated right to have an abortion? No, it's not written in there. So you have to kind of interpret it uh, through a living constitution to say yes. Uh, it's meant to say that you have uh, a right to privacy and a right to your body, and therefore you have a, a, a constitutional um, right to an abortion. Dem- Democrats and Roe v. Wade and Dred Scott took it to, to a level which the only way that they can justify an abortion is to say, well, yeah, you have all these rights, but since the fetus is not a legal person, a legal individual, therefore you have no due process rights, you have no constitutional rights, and therefore there there is no right to constitution, therefore you can kill the baby. So that's how they get around that argument. Okay, and it's the same argument if you extend it out to uh, uh, when someone becomes elderly, 
and loses their faculties. Sure. It's just a matter of time where someone says, well, since they can no longer think for themselves, they no longer can feed uh, themselves, can feed themselves they can, maybe, maybe they don't have the constitutional right, and therefore they're not a legal person. Exactly. Because you can't vote, therefore you're not a legal person. Right. So uh, you could take that argument to any extreme that you want, and that's why it's uh, dangerous to take those arguments to those extremes, because that can happen. Um, so Amy uh, what's Barrett, Barrett. Amy Barrett, Seventh Amy, Circuit. Very let, let me let me pull her up. Go ahead and you can tell us about the other one. I'll pull these pull her up. The other one's actually a local lady from Miami. Her name is Barbara Lagoa. She's uh, grew up here in Miami in Hialeah, as a matter of fact. So it would be actually kind of interesting to have Hialeah in the United States Supreme Court. Uh, but she is I don't know her personally, but I know a lot of people that do know her and. Um, she is a, uh, from what I'm told and my understanding, she's a very liked individual uh, amongst everybody. Um, Christian lady, um, she was. Opposing not only a Christian, or opposing he's opposing a Hispanic and opposing someone from a swing state and a woman and a woman. So I think that's a home run for Trump in any election because now the Democrats. It's just like when Trump uh, killed the uh, terrorist a few uh, months ago. What was the name of that terrorist? I forget. And the Democrats basically came out supporting the terrorist. He basically made the Democrats support a terrorist. So by nominating Lagoa, they're going to make the Democrats oppose a Hispanic woman in a swing state Christian. So uh, I think it's a home run for, for Trump if he nominates her. Okay. Uh, Vanessa, thank you. Okay. And George, so when I'm switching over to the slide presentation, it says that uh, they're saying that my audio is not coming up. So let's, let's just go back over because we showed the pictures of them. To, but we, we're talking about Amy Barrett, Catholic. 48 years old. Yep. Um, a woman from Indiana. Right. I think she has six, seven children, something like that. I don't know. Not sure how many kids she had, but she went to Notre Dame, but let's not hold that against her. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nobody's perfect. <laughs> Nobody's perfect. <clears throat> okay. And then we have Barbara Lagoa from South Florida. Went to FIU, went to Columbia University for law school, um, grew up in Hialeah. I mean... Uh, how much better for, for uh, the South Florida legal community to have some one of their own in, in in the Supreme Court? So now the whole argument now to oppose these either one of these two ladies, whichever one he appoints, I think that's going to be one of the two. I agree. Okay. So the argument is that okay, if you come against either one of these, you're arguing against a woman, right? You that, could turn. He's going to turn it around. Listen, one thing that Trump has been great at, and I think why. A lot of Republicans and a lot of conservatives like Trump, although we may not 100% agree with everything he does, is that he's able to turn around, unlike any other Republican president that we've had, he's able to turn around and stick it right into the media's face as to why they're opposing a particular individual. So, yeah, he, he's going to turn around the fact that, hey, you're, you want a Hispanic? I gave you a Hispanic. You want a woman? I gave you a woman. 
you know, why you are you opposing them because they're Christians? Well, they're you know, it's because you, you know the Democrats are against Christians. Uh, you're opposing her why? Because um, you know, for Roman Catholic views, well, hey, then it's because she's Roman Catholic. You're opposing her why? Because she's Hispanic. Hey, he's opposing. They're opposing Hispanics. It's a home run for for Trump, I think, with exactly. with Lago. Exactly. So so what we what we literally you can't hear now. Can you hear us now? Somebody say, can you hear me or can't hear me? All right. Okay. Yeah. Also once. But, all right. So so here we have, uh, I'm, we just got to keep going. I don't know. If they can hear us, they can hear us. They can't, they can't. You know, that's just the way it goes. Maybe show us our notes. Read the, my notes. <laughs> Read the notes. <laughs> Repeat what you just said about the candidates. Okay? Five of her children and two are adopted from Haiti. All right. Oh, well, I didn't know that. All right. So here's the here's the bottom line. So we are coming up November 3rd. Now let me just tell you concerning voting this year. You need to vote in person. I have over the last few years voted by absentee ballot. I don't trust the absentee ballot at this point. I certainly don't trust all of the uh, vote by mail scams that's going on. Uh, so everyone needs to put on your mask, wear your, keep your hand sanitizer, and go vote in person. Make sure your vote is counted at the voting booth. That's critical. At the same time, as, as, as I said two weeks ago, I started running these little blurps on Vote Pro-Life, not knowing that Ruth Bader Ginsburg was going to pass. Um, but we are at a crisis moment this is the moment i'm going to just say this if president trump is not reelected and he's able to appoint one of these two women he's already appointed 300 federal judges conservative judges mm -hmm. even if he does not win reelection he has functionally and structurally saved america from socialism. He's appointed, this will be his third Supreme Court appointee. I don't even think Obama did that many. No. And the funny thing is, is during Obama's administration, the Democrats instituted a anti-filibustering rule on Supreme Court nominations. And the reason they instituted that rule is because they didn't want the Democrats, I mean the Republicans, filibustering um, a, a, a an Obama-selected a nominated Supreme Court justice and waiting till the next election. So they insisted this rule that you cannot filibuster, which is fantastic because that rule still applies. So the Democrats cannot filibuster whatever nominee the uh, uh, Trump appoints. And luckily, I think we have what, 51? Uh, uh, There's 50, rep 53 Republicans. 53 Republican senators. So but I two of them are shaky right now, but you know, they're going to have to put. All we need is 51. 51. So let's run down how this is going to work in the next few days. I'm, and let me just tell you, the Antifa, Black Lives Matter, the Socialists have all made it public that they're going to riot, have violence, going up to this election if he appoints a Supreme Court justice. Well, he's he, going to appoint. That's going to happen. That's going to happen. He's going to appoint. I think this week he nominates somebody. He's not going to wait around. Now, what's the time frame? I mean, how long? Let's say, let's say he does um, Barbara Lagoa. Okay. Okay. So tomorrow morning he comes out and says, uh, "I have my nominee, Barbara Lagoa, and her family's at the White House," and he brings them out and says, gives her a resume and background and says, "This is my appointment, mm -hmm. my nominee for the Supreme Court." It then proceeds to the Senate. Right. It goes to uh, Mitch McConnell, and he has the ability to set it for a committee uh, uh, as quickly as he wants, have the committee make a determination, and, and set a vote in front of the Senate. Okay. Now, in the committee, as we saw with— uh, that can, All that can happen. I mean, we got less than two months. Um, we can have— We got 44 days. 44 days. 44 days till the election? Yeah. Wow. 
um, maybe it cannot happen that fast, but it can happen. Remember, even if Trump loses, he still has until January 20th um, as president. So the process can, is, is probably, probably going to be ongoing at the time of the election. Um, so Now, there is a, when it gets to the uh, judicial committee, th there are certain rules that they have certain amount of hours or certain amount of time that they can argue against a, a candidate or for you, you, I'm not familiar with the rules, but yes, there are rules on, on and there are certain time limits that they can have. So it, it'll get past that, that before the election. Okay. And it could probably get in front of the Senate. It could get in front of the Senate before the election. All right. And then it uh, kind of will be kind of quick, but still it could happen. Now, what most people don't realize is that the House of Representatives has nothing whatsoever to do no. with the nomination and the approval of a, a judge. None. None. Zero. That's no. the sole. It's another business. Sole responsibility of the Senate. Correct. Okay. So we have the Senate. We have enough people to put it through. Now, let's suppose um, he's unable to complete this before November 3rd. He still has the rest of his term which we can hopefully see that they'll push this thing through. This will be the argument for the next 45. It'll be the argument for the, until whatever. Yep. Okay. Until the, she's, until she's nominated. Exactly. And uh, then they'll talk about impeach her. Yes. Okay. <laughs> for something. For, uh, yeah, they'll come up with something. Okay. Let's impeach, let's impeach, let's impeach Gorsuch. Let's impeach, uh, don't impeach them all. Let's impeach everybody. Yeah. Okay. You know, impeach 45, impeach 45. And impeach. Or you, or they can do what FDR did was try to load the, uh, the Supreme Court. Right. Okay. Because well, there is no limit of Supreme Court justices in the Constitution. Exactly. And that's, that's, that's another ploy that the liberals are trying to the, throw out there. Yep. Um, so, but, and another thing, there's no, there's no, there's no constitutional judgeship for life. Well, it's intended to be for life. When you look at the constitution and you read it, uh, you know, it specifically states, uh, a, a term for the president, a term for the representatives, a term for senators, but there is no term for the Supreme court. And it has historically just been, uh, uh right a uh, um you know an appointment for life that can be removed it has by to be impeachment. by impeachment, impeachment there's, yeah. there's three ways that can be removed impeachment resign or death right that's it okay so we're right now on the on the on the cusp of a really a transformation that you and I probably I didn't think I'd see in my lifetime if lagoa is nominated and appointed I mean she's 52 years old she can easily you know, being a Supreme Court for 25, 30 years. Exactly. Easy. I mean, look at uh, Ginsburg. How long was she there? Too long. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, all right. Well, listen, uh, anybody have any questions that they want to post up there on, on uh, hey, Facebook? Hey, Angel Pena. Angel Pena. All right, let me see if anybody's uh, got any questions or comments they want us to look at here. Senate Majority wisely added Supreme Court nomination to Democrat petition on filibuster. Okay. All right. Well, listen, here's what we're going to do. It's, what time is it? My watch died. 11.46. 11.46. Um, we're going to go ahead and um, receive communion. Let me remind you that during uh, this presentation and now afterwards, you can give by giving, by text giving, 73256. Christ Life Center in the subject line, one word, and you will be um, get a text back, which will give you a menu of what to do to be able to give online. You can give by credit card. You can give however you want to give. Uh, you can also go to our website, and you can give by PayPal if you'd like, whatever methodology you would like to do. But we are at a point now, and we want to receive communion today. I, I think it's I think it's quite important that we recognize that as we're in this battle this is the classic battle of the kingdom of darkness versus the kingdom of light now let me also before i finish this up when we talk about pro-life and we talk about abortion that's not a judgment against a woman 
who has had an abortion. Uh, it's not a, an indictment against someone who's had an abortion. If there's going to be an indictment, in my, my position, it's, it's, it should be the medical professional who performed the abortion, who's scientist and has a background that realizes what they're doing. A lot of women have an abortion buying into the belief system that this is not a human life, that uh, it's, it's just a blob of tissue like you're removing a, a cyst or something like that, which it is not. And uh, so this is not a, in any way whatsoever, to try to cast any condemnation guilt on a woman who has had an abortion. What it is is a challenge for you to be informed, to know what's happening, to know if you had an abortion or, or, or if you're considering having an abortion, you need to look and find out exactly what you're doing. And the, one of the best ways to do that is go to National Right to Life and look at the videos, look at the uh, time span of what's going on in your preborn child and realize uh, what your decision you're making. It is legal at this point. Uh, someone says, should it be illegal? That should be determined by the states. And that will be determined by the states if this happens. But we're going to go ahead and uh, we're going to receive communion here in just a moment. But uh, let me get another little quick video up here. And um, we'll be right back with this. Okay, we're going to go ahead and receive communion today, and um, uh, I think it's important that we just realize that as we receive communion, this is a sacrament that Jesus Christ has given as a reminder that how we can continually appropriate the blessings of God in our lives. Remember, there are two elements. There's the bread, and there is the wine. I went to red wine today because Ricky Abor says he liked red wine better than Chardonnay. So we just poured a little bit of red wine instead. So if you have your communion elements, I want you to join with us. Reading out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Lord, we receive the bread today. And we bless this in the name of Jesus. And we appropriate all of the miracle of healing, of reconciliation, of righteousness through Christ Jesus. Those who may be sick in their body right now in this audience, Lord, I pray right now that as they receive the communion, they receive a miracle. Continue, I continue to stand in, 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 in proxy for my son for a miracle of complete healing in his body and his mind. And Father, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, receive the bread. <clears throat> After the same manner, also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. Lord, we receive the blood of the New Testament. We receive the blessings of forgiveness, reconciliation, restoration with God the Father. 
And we ask you, as of everyone joining together, we honor you with this cup today. In Jesus' name, amen. Receive of the cup. Amen. With that in mind, um, I'm so glad that you joined with us today. And I hope that uh, we want to apologize. I, I, I guess I had the audio off uh, one of the connections when we went to the um, remote PowerPoint. That's why it's important that if you don't hear me or whatever during these times, send me a note. So sometimes when you're doing this by yourself, as Ricky sees it now, it's, it's, it's not an easy project. Hmm. But, and one little thing can cause you some issues. But I want to thank Ricky for coming, and let me just encourage you to, uh, if you need a great attorney, I'm sitting next to one right next to me, Ricky Yabor. You can go to yaborlaw.com. What, what do you specialize in? Tell us a little bit about your law practice. I do well, I work on elections and uh, opposition research and that sort of thing, and then I do a lot of criminal law. Some family law, I don't do it that much, but mainly criminal and elections. And you didn't mention my white hat. Well, I, I was, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, you're looking pretty pretty snappy there with your, you, the, the attorney with the white hat. And well, the, when you mentioned coming over this morning, I said, I got to wear my white hat. As exactly. Well. And I'm glad you did. It was, uh, it added to the presentation today. <laughs> so we're so glad that you all were with us today. We're happy that uh, Jesus Christ is in control. He's in control of this election. It's remarkable that what we're seeing right now has totally, in my opinion, transformed the entire talking point for November 3rd. Now, two things are going to happen. You're going to have all of the people that are liberal going to go out, but we have to have all the Christians and all the people who are conservative, they have to go and vote. That's the most important thing, is that they go and vote. Um, and I think they will. I think uh, people are motivated uh, on, on the right uh, to go vote. They don't like what they, they're seeing around the country. Uh, the, the Republicans have done a good job of pinning all the protests and violence and Black Lives Matter and Antifa and all that on the Democrats. And they have no choice but to support that side. So uh, I have a hard time wrapping my head around the fact that uh, most Americans are, are, are for that. So I think that's why uh, uh, Trump will win. And what's interesting about it is, uh, again, and m most people don't realize that these organizations, Antifa, Black Lives Matter, are socialist communist fronts. Uh, that's, that's their agenda. It's, you know, it's not a really about Black Lives Matter. Every weekend in Chicago, black children are being killed, shot down in their homes in the street, mm -hmm. and no one says anything. All right. That's that is an issue that needs to be resolved. OK, now all of the funding, much of the funding comes from George Soros. And most people don't even know who George Soros is. George Soros was born Jewish. And when they started doing all of the rounding up the Jews, throwing him into concentration camps. George Soros, at the age of 13 and 14 years old, portrayed himself as a Christian, helped turn in other Jews, and when they were arrested and taken off to the concentration camp, he would go into their homes and steal all their, take their possessions. And you can, this is, this is all on, you can go on YouTube, you can see his interviews, and his, his argument was, if I didn't take it, someone else would. Now, I don't know what kind of sick puppy you got there, but that's a sick puppy, okay? But he's a guy who is funding a lot of this insurrection and riots and demonstration. Now, another thing that you want to look at, and, and I want to point, pull this up real quick, and I know we're going to have some issues, um, but I'm going to put it on the screen. I want you to look at this, and uh, because I don't have the audio worked up, I'm going to have you look at this. Now, this is, you can go to GaryNorth.com, and you can go to free books. 
If you really want to know about Planned Parenthood, if you want to know about the racism of Margaret Sanger and the eugenicist and, and, and the whole Planned Parenthood uh, uh, corporation and how they literally are the biggest racists on the planet, download two books. One is called Grand Illusions, and the second one is Killer Angel. And let me put these up, and we probably won't have sound, but I'm going to put it up for Those are two books that you can now get for free, download in the PDF form. You will see the doc Grand Illusions um, is a very, very, I don't know, six, seven hundred page book filled with all of the documentation of the history of Planned Parenthood, filled with all of the documentation of, of racism and how it worked, how they manipulated uh, in the, particularly in the South, the black churches, paying black pastors money to encourage their members to get abortions, all of these kinds of things that, that you see documented. This is, this is the history. This is the real truth that the media don't want you to know about. The Killer Angel, a biography of Margaret Sanger, shows you how disturbed this woman really was and how she hated people who were non-white. She hated them. And uh, as a result, she was one of the main... She's killed more people from her philosophy than any human being on the face of the earth. No other human being is responsible for more death than Margaret Sanger. You can download those two books, read them, and use them. Uh, send them out to your friends. It's free, okay, so they can understand what's going on. So you got anything else you want to share about the election or anything else coming up before we go? No, just go vote. That's the most important thing, and uh, I think it's uh, the responsibility of every Christian to make sure that their vote is counted. So go to the actual poll and vote. Um, I just don't trust mail, mail in voting. I've never mailed in my vote. I've always actually gone out and physically voted you know, personally. And we'll close with this right now. And I want to pray with you. Father, I just pray for each person with us right now. I pray your blessings be upon them. I pray you bless them spiritually, mentally, physically, socially, and financially in every dynamic of their life. And we give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. And we say, good, God bless you. And